Story four of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four The Pot of Caviar it was the fourth day of the siege ammunition and provisions were both nearing an end when the boxer insurrection had suddenly flamed up and roared like a fire in dry grass across northern china the few scattered europeans in the outlying provinces had huddled together at the nearest defensible post and had held on for dear life until rescue came or until it did not in the latter case less said about their fate the better in the former they came back into the world of men with that upon their faces which told that they had looked very closely upon such an end as would ever haunt their dreams ichau was only fifty miles from the coast and there was a european squadron in the gulf of lantong therefore the absurd little garrison consisting of native christians and railway men with a german officer to command them and five civilian europeans to support him held on bravely with the conviction that help must soon come sweeping down to them from the low hills to eastward the sea was visible from those hills and on the sea were their armed countrymen surely then they could not feel deserted with brave hearts they manned the loopholes in the crumbling brick walls outlining the tiny european quarter and they fired away briskly if ineffectively at the rapidly advancing sangars of the boxers it was certain that in another day or so they would be at the end of their resources but then it was equally certain that in another day or so they must be relieved it might be a little sooner or it might be a little later but there was no one who ever ventured to hint that the relief would not arrive in time to pluck them out of the fire up to tuesday night there was no word of discouragement it was true that on the wednesday their robust faith in what was going forward behind those eastern hills had weakened a little the grey slopes lay bare and unresponsive while the deadly sangars pushed ever nearer so near that the dreadful faces which shrieked imprecations at them from time to time over the top could be seen in every hideous feature there was not so much of that now since young ainsley of the diplomatic service with his neat little thirty out three sporting rifle had settled down in the squat church tower and had devoted his days to abating the nuisance but a silent sangar is an even more impressive thing than a clamorous one and steadily irresistibly inevitably the lines of brick and rubble grew closer soon they would be so near that one rush would assuredly carry the frantic swordsman over the frail entrenchment it all seemed very black upon the wednesday evening colonel dressler the german ex-infantry officer went about with an imperturbable face but a heart of lead ralston of the railway was up half the night writing farewell letters Professor Mercer, the old entomologist, was even more silent and grimly thoughtful than ever. Ainsley had lost some of his flippancy. On the whole, the ladies, Miss Sinclair, the nurse of the Scotch mission, Mrs. Patterson, and her pretty daughter Jessie, were the most composed of the party. Father Pierre, of the French mission, was also unaffected, as was natural to one who regarded martyrdom as a glorious crown the boxers yelling for his blood beyond the walls disturbed him less than his forced association with the sturdy scotch presbyterian presence of mr patterson with whom for ten years he had wrangled over the souls of the natives they passed each other now in the corridors as dog passes cat and each kept a watchful eye upon the other lest even in the trenches he might filch some sheep from the rival fold whispering heresy in his ear but the wednesday night passed without a crisis and on the thursday all was bright once more it was ainsley up in the clock tower who had first heard the distant thud of a gun then dressler heard it and within half an hour it was audible to all that strong iron voice calling to them from afar and bidding them to be of good cheer since help was coming it was clear that the landing party from the squadron was well on its way it would not arrive an hour too soon 
the cartridges were nearly finished their half rations of food would soon dwindle to an even more pitiful supply but what need to worry about that now that relief was assured there would be no attack that day as most of the boxers could be seen streaming off in the direction of the distant firing and the long lines of sangers were silent and deserted they were all able therefore to assemble at the lunch table a merry talkative party full of that joy of living which sparkles most brightly under the imminent shadow of death the pot of caviar cried ainsley come professor out with the pot of caviar pot thousand yes grunted old dressler it is certain time that we had that famous pot the ladies joined in and from all parts of the long ill-furnished table there came the demand for caviar it was a strange time to ask for such a delicacy but the reason is soon told professor mercer the old californian entomologist had received a jar of caviar in a hamper of goods from san francisco arriving a day or two before the outbreak in the general pooling and distribution of provisions this one dainty and three bottles of lacrima christi from the same hamper had been accepted and set aside by common consent they were to be reserved for the final joyous meal when the end of their peril should be in sight even as they sat the thud thud of the relieving guns came to their ears more luxurious music to their lunch than the most sybaritic restaurant of london could have supplied before evening the relief would certainly be there why then should their stale bread not be glorified by the treasured caviar but the professor shook his gnarled old head and smiled his inscrutable smile better wait said he wait why wait cried the company they still have far to come he answered they will be here for supper at the latest said ralston of the railway a keen bird-like man with bright eyes and long projecting nose they cannot be more than ten miles from us now if they only did two miles an hour it would make them do at seven there is a battle on the way remarked the colonel you will grant two hours or three hours for the battle not half an hour cried ainsley they will walk through them as if they were not there what can these rascals with their matchlocks and swords do against modern weapons well it depends on who leads the column of relief said dressler if they are fortunate enough to have a german officer an englishman for my money cried ralston the french commodore is said to be an excellent strategist remarked father pierre i don't see that it matters a toss cried the exuberant ainsley mr mauser and mr maxim are the two men who will see us through and with them on our side no leader can go wrong i tell you they will just brush them aside and walk through them so now professor come on with that pot of caviar but the old scientist was unconvinced we shall reserve it for supper said he after all said mr patterson in his slow precise scottish intonation it will be a courtesy to our guests the officers of the relief if we have some palatable food to lay before them i'm in agreement with the professor that we reserve the caviar for supper the argument appealed to their sense of hospitality there was something pleasantly chivalrous too in the idea of keeping their one little delicacy to give a savour to the meal of their preservers there was no more talk of the caviar by the way professor said mr patterson i've only heard to-day that this is the second time that you have been besieged in this way i'm sure we should all be very interested to hear some details of your previous experience the old man's face set very grimly i was in sung tong in south china in eighty nine said he it's a very extraordinary coincidence that you should twice have been in such a perilous situation said the missionary tell us how you were relieved at sung tong the shadow deepened upon the weary face we were not relieved said he what the place fell yes it fell and you came through alive i am a doctor as well as an entomologist they had many wounded they spared me and the rest 
assez assez cried the little french priest raising his hand in protest he had been twenty years in china the professor had said nothing but there was something some lurking horror in his dull gray eyes which had turned the ladies pale i am sorry said the missionary i can see that it is a painful subject i should not have asked no the professor answered slowly it is wiser not to ask it is better not to speak about such things at all but surely those guns are very much nearer there could be no doubt of it after a silence the thud thud had recommenced with a lively ripple of rifle fire playing all round that deep bass master note it must be just at the farther side of the nearest hill they pushed back their chairs and ran out to the ramparts the silent-footed native servants came in and cleared the scanty remains from the table but after they had left the old professor sat on there his massive grey-crowned head leaning upon his hands and the same pensive look of horror in his eyes some ghosts may be laid for years but when they do rise it is not so easy to drive them back to their slumbers the guns had ceased outside but he had not observed it lost as he was in the one supreme and terrible memory of his life his thoughts were interrupted at last by the entrance of the commandant there was a complacent smile upon his broad german face the kaiser will be pleased said he rubbing his hands yes certainly it should mean a decoration defence of Ichau against the boxers by colonel dressler late major of the hundred and fourteenth hanoverian infantry splendid resistance of small garrison against overwhelming odds it will certainly appear in the berlin papers then you think we are saved said the old man with neither emotion nor exultation in his voice the colonel smiled why professor said he i have seen you more excited on the morning when you brought back lepidus mercianus in your collecting box the fly was safe in my collecting box first the entomologist answered i have seen so many strange turns of fate in my long life that i do not grieve nor do i rejoice until i know that i have cause but tell me the news well said the colonel lighting his long pipe and stretching his gaitered legs in the bamboo chair i'll stake my military reputation that all is well they are advancing swiftly the firing has died down to show that resistance is at an end and within an hour we'll see them over the brow ainsley is to fire his gun three times from the church's tower as a signal and then we shall make a little sally on our own account and you are waiting for this signal yes we are waiting for ainsley's shots i thought i would spend the time with you for i had something to ask you what was it well you remember your talk about the other siege the siege of sung tong it interests me very much from a professional point of view now that the ladies and civilians are gone you will have no objection to discussing it it is not a pleasant subject no i dare say not mein gott it was indeed a tragedy but you have seen how i have conducted the defence here was it wise was it good was it worthy of the traditions of the german army i think you could have done no more thank you but this other place was it as ably defended to me a comparison of this sort is very interesting could it have been saved no everything possible was done save only one thing ah there was one omission what was it no one above all no woman should have been allowed to fall alive into the hands of the chinese the colonel held out his broad red hand and enfolded the long white nervous fingers of the professor you are right a thousand times right but do not think that this has escaped my thoughts for myself i would die fighting so would ralston and so would ainsley i have talked to them and it is settled but the others i have spoken with them but what are you to do there are the priest and the missionary and the women would they wish to be taken alive they would not promise to take steps to prevent it 
they would not lay hands on their own lives their consciences would not permit it of course it is all over now and we need not speak of such dreadful things but what would you have done in my place kill them my god you would murder them in mercy i would kill them man i have been through it i have seen the death of the hot eggs i have seen the death of the boiling kettle i have seen the women my god i wonder that i have ever slept sound again his usually impassive face was working and quivering with the agony of the remembrance i was strapped to a stake with thorns in my eyelids to keep them open and my grief at their torture was a less thing than my self-reproach when i thought that i could with one tube of tasteless tablets have snatched them at the last instant from the hands of their tormentors murder i am ready to stand at the divine bar and answer for a thousand murders such as that sin why it is such an act as might well cleanse the stain of real sin from the soul but if knowing what i do i should have failed this second time to do it then by heaven there is no hell deep enough or hot enough to receive my guilty craven spirit the colonel rose and again his hand clasped that of the professor you speak sense said he you are a brave man who know your own mind yes by the lord you would have been my great help had things gone the other way i have often thought and wondered in the dark early hours of the morning but i did not know how to do it but we should have heard ainsley's shots before now i will go and see again the old scientist sat alone with his thoughts finally as neither the guns of the relieving force nor yet the signal of their approach sounded upon his ears he rose and was about to go himself upon the ramparts to make inquiry when the door flew open and colonel dressler staggered into the room his face was of a ghastly yellow white and his chest heaved like that of a man exhausted with running there was brandy on the side table and he gulped down a glassful then he dropped heavily into a chair well said the professor coldly they are not coming no they cannot come there was silence for a minute or more the two men staring blankly at each other do they all know no one knows but me how did you learn i was at the wall near the postern gate the little wooden gate that opens on the rose garden i saw something crawling among the bushes there was a knocking at the door i opened it it was a christian tartar badly cut about with swords he had come from the battle commodore wyndham the englishman had sent him the relieving force had been checked they had shot away most of their ammunition they had entrenched themselves and sent back to the ships for more three days must pass before they could come that was all my god it was enough the professor bent his shaggy gray brows where is the man he asked he is dead he died of loss of blood his body lies at the postern gate and no one saw him not to speak to oh they did not see him then ainsley must have seen him from the church tower he must know that i have had tidings he will want to know what they are if i tell him they must all know how long can we hold out an hour or two at the most is that absolutely certain i pledge my credit as a soldier upon it then we must fall yes we must fall there is no hope for us none the door flew open and young ainsley rushed in behind him crowded ralston patterson and a crowd of white men and of native christians you've had news colonel professor mercer pushed to the front colonel dressler has just been telling me it is all right they have halted but will be here in the early morning there is no longer any danger a cheer broke from the group in the doorway everyone was laughing and shaking hands but suppose they rush us before tomorrow morning cried ralston in a petulant voice what infernal fools these fellows are not to push on lazy devils they should be court-martialed every man of them 
it's all safe said ainsley these fellows have had a bad knock we can see their wounded being carried by the hundred over the hill they must have lost heavily they won't attack before morning no no said the colonel it is certain that they won't attack before morning none the less get back to your posts we must give no point away he left the room with the rest but as he did so he looked back and his eyes for an instant met those of the old professor i leave it in your hands was the message which he flashed a stern set smile was his answer the afternoon wore away without the boxers making their last attack to colonel dressler it was clear that the unwanted stillness meant only that they were reassembling their forces from their fight with the relief column and were gathering themselves for the inevitable and final rush to all the others it appeared that the siege was indeed over and that the assailants had been crippled by the losses which they had already sustained it was a joyous and noisy party therefore which met at the supper-table when the three bottles of lacryma christi were uncorked and the famous pot of caviar was finally opened it was a large jar and though each had a tablespoonful of the delicacy it was by no means exhausted ralston who was an epicure had a double allowance he pecked away at it like a hungry bird ainsley too had a second helping the professor took a large spoonful himself and colonel dressler watching him narrowly did the same the ladies ate freely save only pretty miss patterson who disliked the salty pungent taste in spite of the hospitable entreaties of the professor her portion lay hardly touched at the side of her plate you don't like my little delicacy it is a disappointment to me when i had kept it for your pleasure said the old man i beg that you will eat the caviar well, i've never tasted it before no doubt i should like it in time well you must make a beginning why not start to educate your taste now do please pretty jessie patterson's bright face shone with her sunny boyish smile why how earnest you are she smiled i had no idea you were so polite professor mercer even if i do not eat it i am just as grateful you are foolish not to eat it said the professor with such intensity that the smile died from her face and her eyes reflected the earnestness of his own i tell you it is foolish not to eat caviar to-night but why why she asked because you have it on your plate because it is sinful to waste it there there said stout mrs patterson leaning across don't trouble her any more i can see that she does not like it but it shall not be wasted she passed the blade of her knife under it and scraped it from jessie's plate on to her own now it won't be wasted your mind will be at ease professor but it did not seem at ease on the contrary his face was agitated like that of a man who encounters an unexpected and formidable obstacle he was lost in thought the conversation buzzed cheerily every one was full of his future plans no no there is no holiday for me said father pierre we priests don't get holidays now that the mission and school are formed i am to leave it to father Emile and to push westwards to found another you are leaving said mr patterson you don't mean that you are going away from Ichau? father pierre shook his venerable head in waggish reproof you must not look so pleased mr patterson well well our views are very different said the presbyterian but there is no personal feeling towards you father pierre at the same time how any reasonable educated man at this time of the world's history can teach these poor benighted heathen that a general buzz of remonstrance silenced the theology what will you do yourself mr patterson asked some one well i'll take three months in edinburgh to attend the annual meeting you'll be glad to do some shopping in princess street i'm thinking mary and you jessie you'll see some folk your own age then we can come back in the fall when your nerves have had a rest 
indeed we shall all need it said miss sinclair the mission nurse you know this long strain takes me in the strangest way at the present moment i can hear such a buzzing in my ears well that's funny for it's just the same with me cried ainsley an absurd up and down buzzing as if a drunken blue bottle were trying experiments on his register as you say it must be due to nervous strain for my part i'm going back to peking and i hope i may get some promotion over this affair i can get good polo here and that's a fine change of thought as i know how about you ralston oh i don't know i've hardly had time to think i want to have a real good sunny bright holiday and forget it all it was funny to see all the letters in my room it looked so black on wednesday night that i had settled up my affairs and written to all my friends i don't quite know how they were to be delivered but i trusted to luck i think i will keep those papers as a souvenir they will always remind me of how close a shave we have had yes i would keep them said dressler his voice was so deep and solemn that every eye was turned upon him what is it colonel you seem in the blues to-night it was ainsley who spoke no no i am very contented well so you should be when you see success in sight i am sure we are all indebted to you for your science and skill i don't think we could have held the place without you ladies and gentlemen i ask you to drink the health of colonel dressler of the imperial german army er so leben oh they all stood up and raised their glasses to the soldier with smiles and bows his pale face flushed with professional pride i have always kept my books with me i have forgotten nothing said he i do not think that more could be done if things had gone wrong with us and the place had fallen you would i am sure have freed me from any blame or responsibility he looked wistfully round him i'm voicing the sentiment of this company colonel dressler said the scotch minister when i say oh but lord save us what's amiss with mr ralston he had dropped his face upon his folded arms and was placidly sleeping oh don't mind him said the professor hurriedly we are all in the stage of reaction now i have no doubt that we are all liable to collapse it is only to-night that we shall feel what we have gone through i'm sure i can fully sympathize with him said mrs patterson i don't know when i have been more sleepy i can hardly hold my own head up she cuddled back in her chair and shut her eyes well i've never known mary to do that before cried her husband laughing heartily gone to sleep over her supper whatever will she think when we tell her of it afterwards but the air does seem hot and heavy i can certainly excuse any one who falls asleep to-night i think that i shall turn in early myself ainsley was in a talkative excited mood he was on his feet once more with his glass in his hand i think we ought to have one drink all together and then sing old lang syne said he smiling round at the company for a week we have all pulled in the same boat and we've got to know each other as people never do in the quiet days of peace we've learned to appreciate each other and we've learned to appreciate each other's nations there's the colonel here stands for germany and father pierre is for france then there's the professor for america ralston and i are britishers then there's the ladies god bless em they have been angels of mercy and compassion all through the siege i think we should drink the health of the ladies wonderful thing the quiet courage the patience the what shall i say the fortitude the the by george look at the colonel he's gone to sleep too most infernal sleepy weather his glass crashed down upon the table and he sank back mumbling and muttering into his seat miss sinclair the pale mission nurse had dropped off also she lay like a broken lily across the arm of her chair mr patterson looked round him and sprang to his feet he passed his hand over his flushed forehead this isn't natural jessie he cried why are they all asleep 
There's Father Pierre. He's off, too. Jesse, Jesse, your mother is cold. Is it sleep? Is it death? Open the windows. Help, help, help! He staggered to his feet and rushed to the windows, but midway his head spun round, his knees sank under him, and he pitched forward upon his face. The young girl had also sprung to her feet. She looked round her with horror-stricken eyes at her prostrate father and the silent ring of figures. "'Professor Mercer, what is it? What is it?' she cried. "'Oh, my God, they are dying! They are dead!' The old man had raised himself by a supreme effort of his will, though the darkness was already gathering thickly round him. "'My dear young lady,' he said, stuttering and stumbling over the words, "'we should have spared you this. It would have been painless to mind and body. It was cyanide. I had it in the caviar. But you would not have it. Great heavens!' She shrank away from him with dilated eyes. "'Oh, you monster, you monster! You have poisoned them!' "'No, no, I saved them. You don't know the Chinese. They are horrible. In another hour we should all have been in their hands. Take it now, child.' Even as he spoke, a burst of firing broke out under the very windows of the room. "'Hark! There they are. Quick, dear, quick! You may cheat them yet.' but his words fell upon deaf ears, for the girl had sunk back senseless in her chair. The old man stood listening for an instant to the firing outside. But what was that? Merciful father, what was that? Was he going mad? Was it the effect of the drug? Surely it was a European cheer. Yes, there were sharp orders in English. There was the shouting of sailors. He could no longer doubt it. By some miracle the relief had come after all. He threw his long arms upwards in his despair. What have I done? Oh, good Lord, what have I done? he cried. It was Commodore Wyndham himself who was the first, after his desperate and successful night attack, to burst into that terrible supper-room. Round the table sat the white and silent company. Only in the young girl who moaned and faintly stirred was any sign of life to be seen, and yet there was one in the circle who had the energy for a last supreme duty. The Commodore, standing stupefied at the door, saw a grey head slowly lifted from the table, and the tall form of the Professor staggered for an instant to its feet. "'Take care of the caviar! For God's sake, don't touch the caviar!' he croaked. Then he sank back once more, and the circle of death was complete. End of Story 4 Story 5 of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 5 The Japaned Box it was a curious thing, said the private tutor, one of those grotesque and whimsical incidents which occur to one as one goes through life. I lost the best situation which I am ever likely to have through it. But I am glad that I went to Thorpe Place, for I gained. Well, as I tell you the story, you will learn what I gained. I don't know whether you are familiar with that part of the Midlands which is drained by the Avon. It is the most English part of England. Shakespeare, the flower of the whole race, was born right in the middle of it. It is a land of rolling pastures, rising in higher folds to the westward until they swell into the Malvern Hills. There are no towns, but numerous villages, each with its grey Norman church. You have left the brick of the southern and eastern counties behind you, and everything is stone stone for the walls, and lichened slabs of stone for the roofs. It is all grim and solid and massive, as befits the heart of a great nation. It was in the middle of this country, not very far from Evesham, that Sir John Bollamore lived in the old ancestral home of Thorpe Place, and thither it was that I came to teach his two little sons. Sir John was a widower, his wife had died three years before, and he had been left with these two lads, aged eight and ten, and one dear little girl of seven. 
Miss Witherton, who is now my wife, was governess to this little girl. I was tutor to the two boys. Could there be a more obvious prelude to an engagement? She governs me now, and I tutor two little boys of our own. But there, I have already revealed what it was which I gained in Thorpe Place. It was a very, very old house, incredibly old, pre-Norman some of it, and the Bollamores claimed to have lived in that situation since long before the conquest. It struck a chill to my heart when first I came there, those enormously thick grey walls, the rude crumbling stones, the smell as from a sick animal which exhaled from the rotting plaster of the aged building. But the modern wing was bright, and the garden was well kept no house could be dismal which had a pretty girl inside it and such a show of roses in front apart from a very complete staff of servants there were only four of us in the household these were miss witherton who was at that time four and twenty and as pretty well as pretty as mrs calmer is now myself frank calmer aged thirty mrs stevens the housekeeper a dry silent woman and Mr. Richards, a tall, military-looking man, who acted as steward to the Bollamore estates. We four always had our meals together, but Sir John had his usually alone in the library. Sometimes he joined us at dinner, but on the whole we were just as glad when he did not. For he was a very formidable person. Imagine a man six feet three inches in height, majestically built with a high-nosed aristocratic face brindled hair shaggy eyebrows a small pointed mephistophelian beard and lines about his brow and round his eyes as deep as if they had been carved with a penknife he had grey eyes weary hopeless-looking eyes proud and yet pathetic eyes which claimed your pity and yet dared you to show it his back was rounded with study, but otherwise he was as fine a looking man of his age, five and fifty perhaps, as any woman would wish to look upon. But his presence was not a cheerful one. He was always courteous, always refined, but singularly silent and retiring. I have never lived so long with any man and known so little of him. If he were indoors, he spent his time either in his own small study in the eastern tower, or in the library in the modern wing. So regular was his routine that one could always say at any hour exactly where he would be. Twice in the day he would visit his study, once after breakfast and once about ten at night. You might set your watch by the slam of the heavy door. For the rest of the day he would be in his library, save that for an hour or two in the afternoon he would take a walk or a ride, which was solitary like the rest of his existence. He loved his children and was keenly interested in the progress of their studies, but they were a little awed by the silent, shaggy-browed figure, and they avoided him as much as they could. Indeed, we all did that. It was some time before I came to know anything about the circumstances of Sir John Bollamore's life, for Mrs. Stevens, the housekeeper, and Mr. Richards, the land steward, were too loyal to talk easily of their employer's affairs. As to the governess, she knew no more than I did, and our common interest was one of the causes which drew us together. At last, however, an incident occurred which led to a closer acquaintance with Mr. Richards and a fuller knowledge of the life of the man whom I served. The immediate cause of this was no less than the falling of Master Percy, the youngest of my pupils, into the mill-race, with imminent danger both to his life and to mine, since I had to risk myself in order to save him. Dripping and exhausted, for I was far more spent than the child, I was making for my room when Sir John, who had heard the hubbub, opened the door of his little study and asked me what was the matter. I told him of the accident, but assured him that his child was in no danger, while he listened with a rugged, immobile face which expressed in its intense eyes and tightened lips all the emotion which he tried to conceal. "'One moment. Step in here. Let me have the details,' said he, turning back through the open door." and so I found myself within that little sanctum, inside which, as I afterwards learned, 
no other foot had for three years been set save that of the old servant who cleaned it out it was a round room conforming to the shape of the tower in which it was situated with a low ceiling a single narrow ivy-wreathed window and the simplest of furniture an old carpet a single chair a deal table and a small shelf of books made up the whole contents on the table stood a full-length photograph of a woman i took no particular notice of the features but i remember that a certain gracious gentleness was the prevailing impression beside it were a large black japanned box and one or two bundles of letters or papers fastened together with elastic bands our interview was a short one for sir john bollamore perceived that i was soaked and that i should change without delay the incident led however to an instructive talk with richards the agent who had never penetrated into the chamber which chance had opened to me that very afternoon he came to me all curiosity and walked up and down the garden path with me while my two charges played tennis upon the lawn behind us you hardly realize the exception which has been made in your favor said he that room has been kept such a mystery and sir john's visits to it have been so regular and consistent that an almost superstitious feeling has arisen about it in the household i assure you that if i were to repeat to you the tales which are flying about the tales of mysterious visitors there and of voices overheard by the servants you might suspect that sir john had relapsed into his old ways why do you say relapsed i asked he looked at me in surprise is it possible said he that sir john bollamore's previous history is unknown to you absolutely you astound me i thought that every man in england knew something of his antecedents i should not mention the matter if it were not that you are now one of ourselves and that the facts might come to your ears in some harsher form if i were silent upon them i always took it for granted that you knew that you were in the service of devil bollamore but why devil i asked ah you are young and the world moves fast but twenty years ago the name of devil bollamore was one of the best known in london he was the leader of the fastest set bruiser driver gambler drunkard a survival of the old type and as bad as the worst of them i stared at him in amazement what i cried that quiet studious sad-faced man the greatest rip and debauchee in england all between ourselves colmore but you understand now what i mean when i say that a woman's voice in his room might even now give rise to suspicions but what can have changed him so little beryl clare when she took the risk of becoming his wife that was the turning point he had got so far that his own fast set had thrown him over there is a world of difference you know between a man who drinks and a drunkard they all drink but they taboo a drunkard he had become a slave to it hopeless and helpless then she stepped in saw the possibilities of a fine man in the wreck took her chance in marrying him though she might have had the pick of a dozen and by devoting her life to it brought him back to manhood and decency you have observed that no liquor is ever kept in the house there never has been any since her foot crossed its threshold a drop of it would be like blood to a tiger even now then her influence still holds him that is the wonder of it when she died three years ago we all expected and feared that he would fall back into his old ways she feared it herself and the thought gave a terror to death for she was like a guardian angel to that man and lived only for the one purpose by the way did you see a black japanned box in his room yes i fancy it contains her letters if ever he has occasion to be away if only for a single night he invariably takes his black japanned box with him well well calmore perhaps i have told you rather more than i should but i shall expect you to reciprocate if anything of interest should come to your knowledge 
i could see that the worthy man was consumed with curiosity and just a little piqued that i the newcomer should have been the first to penetrate into the untrodden chamber but the fact raised me in his esteem and from that time onwards i found myself upon more confidential terms with him and now the silent and majestic figure of my employer became an object of greater interest to me i began to understand that strangely human look in his eyes those deep lines upon his careworn face he was a man who was fighting a ceaseless battle holding at arm's length from morning till night a horrible adversary who was for ever trying to close with him an adversary which would destroy him body and soul could it but fix its claws once more upon him as i watched the grim round-backed figure pacing the corridor or walking in the garden this imminent danger seemed to take bodily shape and i could almost fancy that i saw this most loathsome and dangerous of all the fiends crouching closely in his very shadow like a half-cowed beast which slinks beside its keeper ready at any unguarded moment to spring at his throat and the dead woman the woman who had spent her life in warding off this danger took shape also to my imagination and i saw her as a shadowy but beautiful presence which intervened forever with arms uplifted to screen the man whom she loved in some subtle way he divined the sympathy which i had for him and he showed in his own silent fashion that he appreciated it he even invited me once to share his afternoon walk and although no word passed between us on this occasion it was a mark of confidence which he had never shown to any one before he asked me also to index his library it was one of the best private libraries in england and i spent many hours in the evening in his presence if not in his society he reading at his desk and i sitting in a recess by the window reducing to order the chaos which existed among his books in spite of these close relations i was never again asked to enter the chamber in the turret and then came my revulsion of feeling a single incident changed all my sympathy to loathing and made me realize that my employer still remained all that he had ever been with the additional vice of hypocrisy what happened was as follows one evening miss witherton had gone down to broadway the neighboring village to sing at a concert for some charity and i according to my promise had walked over to escort her back the drive sweeps round under the eastern turret and i observed as i passed that the light was lit in the circular room it was a summer evening and the window which was a little higher than our heads was open we were as it happened engrossed in our own conversation at the moment and we had paused upon the lawn which skirts the old turret when suddenly something broke in upon our talk and turned our thoughts away from our own affairs it was a voice the voice undoubtedly of a woman it was low so low that it was only in that still night air that we could have heard it but hushed as it was there was no mistaking its feminine timbre it spoke hurriedly gaspingly for a few sentences and then was silent a piteous breathless imploring sort of voice miss witherton and i stood for an instant staring at each other then we walked quickly in the direction of the hall door it came through the window i said we must not play the part of eavesdroppers she answered we must forget that we have ever heard it there was an absence of surprise in her manner which suggested a new idea to me you have heard it before i cried i could not help it my own room is higher up on the same turret it has happened frequently who can the woman be i have no idea i had rather not discuss it her voice was enough to show me what she thought but granting that our employer led a double and dubious life who could she be this mysterious woman who kept him company in the old tower i knew from my own inspection how bleak and bare a room it was she certainly did not live there but in that case where did she come from 
It could not be any one of the household. They were all under the vigilant eyes of Mrs. Stevens. The visitor must come from without. But how? And then, suddenly, I remembered how ancient this building was, and how probable that some medieval passage existed in it. There is hardly an old castle without one. The mysterious room was the basement of the turret, so that if there were anything of the sort it would open through the floor. There were numerous cottages in the immediate vicinity. The other end of the secret passage might lie among some tangle of bramble in the neighboring copse. I said nothing to any one, but I felt that the secret of my employer lay within my power. And the more convinced I was of this, the more I marveled at the manner in which he concealed his true nature. Often as I watched his austere figure I asked myself if it were indeed possible that such a man should be living this double life, and I tried to persuade myself that my suspicions might after all prove to be ill-founded. But there was the female voice, there was the secret nightly rendezvous in the turret chamber. How could such facts admit of an innocent interpretation? I conceived a horror of the man. I was filled with loathing at his deep, consistent hypocrisy. Only once during all those months did I ever see him without that sad but impassive mask which he usually presented towards his fellow man. For an instant I caught a glimpse of those volcanic fires which he had damped down so long. The occasion was an unworthy one for the object of his wrath was none other than the aged charwoman whom i have already mentioned as being the one person who was allowed within his mysterious chamber i was passing the corridor which led to the turret for my own room lay in that direction when i heard a sudden startled scream and merged in it the husky growling note of a man who is inarticulate with passion it was the snarl of a furious wild beast. Then I heard his voice thrilling with anger. "'You would dare!' he cried. "'You would dare to disobey my directions!' An instant later the charwoman passed me, flying down the passage, white-faced and tremulous, while the terrible voice thundered behind her, "'Go to Mrs. Stevens for your money. Never set foot in Thorpe Place again!' Consumed with curiosity, I could not help following the woman, and found her round the corner, leaning against the wall and palpitating like a frightened rabbit. "'What is the matter, Mrs. Brown?' I asked. "'It's master,' she gasped. "'Oh, how oh, he frightened me! If you had seen his eyes, Mr. Calmer, sir, I thought you would have the death of me!' "'But what had you done?' done sir nothing at least nothing to make so much of just laid my hand on that black box of his and even opened it when he came in and you heard the way he went on i've lost my place and glad i am of it for i would never trust myself within reach of him again so it was the japanned box which was the cause of this outburst the box from which he would never permit himself to be separated what was the connection or was there any connection between this and the secret visits of the lady whose voice i had overheard sir john bollamore's wrath was enduring as well as fiery for from that day mrs brown the charwoman vanished from our ken and thorpe place knew her no more and now i wish to tell you the singular chance which solved all these strange questions and put my employer's secret in my possession the story may leave you with some lingering doubt as to whether my curiosity did not get the better of my honour and whether i did not condescend to play the spy if you choose to think so i cannot help it but can only assure you that improbable as it may appear the matter came about exactly as i describe it the first stage in this denouement was that the small room on the turret became uninhabitable this occurred through the fall of the worm-eaten oaken beam which supported the ceiling rotten with age it snapped in the middle of one morning and brought down a quantity of plaster with it fortunately sir john was not in the room at the time 
His precious box was rescued from amongst the debris and brought into the library, where, henceforward, it was locked within his bureau. Sir John took no steps to repair the damage, and I never had an opportunity of searching for that secret passage, the existence of which I had surmised. As to the lady, I had thought that this would have brought her visits to an end, had I not one evening heard Mr. Richards asking Mrs. Stevens who the woman was whom he had overheard talking to Sir John in the library. I could not catch her reply, but I saw from her manner that it was not the first time that she had to answer or avoid the same question. "'You've heard the voice, Colmore?' said the agent. I confessed that I had. "'And what do you think of it?' I shrugged my shoulders and remarked that it was no business of mine. "'Come, come, you are just as curious as any of us. Is it a woman or not?' Oh, "'It is certainly a woman.' "'Which room did you hear it from?' from the turret room before the ceiling fell but i heard it from the library only last night i passed the doors as i was going to bed and i heard something wailing and praying just as plainly as i hear you it may be a woman why what else could it be he looked at me hard there are more things in heaven and earth said he if it is a woman how does she get there i don't know no nor i but if it is the other thing but there for a practical business man at the end of the nineteenth century this is rather a ridiculous line of conversation he turned away but i saw that he felt even more than he had said to all the old ghost stories of thorpe place a new one was being added before our very eyes it may by this time have taken its permanent place for though an explanation came to me, it never reached the others. And my explanation came in this way. I had suffered a sleepless night from neuralgia, and about midday I had taken a heavy dose of chlorodyne to alleviate the pain. At that time I was finishing the indexing of Sir John Bollamore's library, and it was my custom to work there from five till seven. On this particular day I struggled against the double effect of my bad night and the narcotic. I have already mentioned that there was a recess in the library, and in this it was my habit to work. I settled down steadily to my task, but my weariness overcame me, and falling back upon the settee I dropped into a heavy sleep. How long I slept I do not know, but it was quite dark when I awoke confused by the chlorodyne which i had taken i lay motionless in a semi-conscious state the great room with its high walls covered with books loomed darkly all around me a dim radiance from the moonlight came through the farther window and against this lighter background i saw that sir john bollamore was sitting at his study table his well-set head and clearly cut profile were sharply outlined against the glimmering square behind him he bent as i watched him and i heard the sharp turning of a key and the rasping of metal upon metal as if in a dream i was vaguely conscious that this was the japanned box which stood in front of him and that he had drawn something out of it something squat and uncouth which now lay before him upon the table i never realized it never occurred to my bemuddled and torpid brain that i was intruding upon his privacy that he imagined himself to be alone in the room and then just as it rushed upon my horrified perceptions and i had half risen to announce my presence i heard a strange crisp metallic clicking and then the voice yes it was a woman's voice there could not be a doubt of it but a voice so charged with entreaty and with yearning love that it will ring forever in my ears it came with a curious far-away tinkle but every word was clear though faint very faint for they were the last words of a dying woman i am not really gone john said the thin gasping voice i am here at your very elbow and shall be until we meet once more i die happy to think that morning and night you will hear my voice oh john be strong be strong until we meet again 
i say that i had risen in order to announce my presence but i could not do so while the voice was sounding i could only remain half lying half sitting paralyzed astounded listening to those yearning distant musical words and he he was so absorbed that even if i had spoken he might not have heard me but with the silence of the voice came my half-articulated apologies and explanations he sprang across the room switched on the electric light and in its white glare i saw him his eyes gleaming with anger his face twisted with passion as the hapless charwoman may have seen him weeks before mr colmore he cried you here what is the meaning of this sir with halting words i explained it all my neuralgia the narcotic my luckless sleep and singular awakening as he listened the glow of anger faded from his face and the sad impassive mask closed once more over his features my secret is yours mr colmore said he i have only myself to blame for relaxing my precautions half confidences are worse than no confidences and so you may know all since you know so much the story may go where you will when i have passed away but until then i rely upon your sense of honour that no human soul shall hear it from your lips i am proud still god help me or at least i am proud enough to resent that pity which this story would draw upon me i have smiled at envy and disregarded hatred but pity is more than i can tolerate you have heard the source from which the voice comes that voice which has as i understand excited so much curiosity in my household i am aware of the rumours to which it has given rise these speculations whether scandalous or superstitious are such as i can disregard and forgive what i should never forgive would be a disloyal spying and eavesdropping in order to satisfy an illicit curiosity but of that mr colmore i acquit you when i was a young man sir many years younger than you are now i was launched upon town without a friend or adviser and with a purse which brought only too many false friends and false advisers to my side i drank deeply of the wine of life if there is a man living who has drank more deeply he is not a man whom i envy my purse suffered my character suffered my constitution suffered stimulants became a necessity to me i was a creature from whom my memory recoils and it was at that time the time of my blackest degradation that god sent into my life the gentlest sweetest spirit that ever descended as a ministering angel from above she loved me broken as i was loved me and spent her life in making a man once more of that which had degraded itself to the level of the beasts but a fell disease struck her and she withered away before my eyes in the hour of her agony it was never of herself of her own sufferings and of her own death that she thought it was all of me the one pang which her fate brought to her was the fear that when her influence was removed i should revert to that which i had been it was in vain that i made oath to her that no drop of wine would ever cross my lips she knew only too well the hold that the devil had upon me she who had striven so to loosen it and it haunted her night and day the thought that my soul might again be within his grip it was from some friend's gossip of the sick-room that she heard of this invention this phonograph and with the quick insight of a loving woman she saw how she might use it for her ends she sent me to london to procure the best which money could buy with her dying breath she gasped into it the words which have held me straight ever since lonely and broken what else have i in all the world to uphold me but it is enough please god i shall face her without shame when he is pleased to reunite us that is my secret mr colmore and whilst i live i leave it in your keeping end of story five
Story six of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six The Black Doctor Bishop's Crossing is a small village lying ten miles in the southwesterly direction from Liverpool. Here in the early seventies there settled a doctor named Aloysius Lana nothing was known locally either of his antecedents or of the reasons which had prompted him to come to this lancashire hamlet two facts only were certain about him the one that he had gained his medical qualification with some distinction at glasgow the other that he came undoubtedly of a tropical race and was so dark that he might almost have had a strain of the indian in his composition his predominant features were however european and he possessed a stately courtesy and carriage which suggested a spanish extraction a swarthy skin raven-black hair and dark sparkling eyes under a pair of heavily tufted eyebrows made a strange contrast to the flaxen or chestnut rustics of england and the newcomer was soon known as the black doctor of bishop's crossing at first it was a term of ridicule and reproach as the years went on it became a title of honor which was familiar to the whole countryside and extended far beyond the narrow confines of the village for the newcomer proved himself to be a capable surgeon and an accomplished physician the practice of that district had been in the hands of edward rowe the son of sir william rowe the liverpool consultant but he had not inherited the talents of his father and dr lana with his advantages of presence and of manner soon beat him out of the field dr lana's social success was as rapid as his professional a remarkable surgical cure in the case of the hon james lowry the second son of lord belton was the means of introducing him to county society where he became a favorite through the charm of his conversation and the elegance of his manners an absence of antecedents and of relatives is sometimes an aid rather than impediment to social advancement and the distinguished individuality of the handsome doctor was its own recommendation his patients had one fault and one fault only to find with him he appeared to be a confirmed bachelor this was the more remarkable since the house which he occupied was a large one and it was known that his success in practice had enabled him to save considerable sums at first the local matchmakers were continually coupling his name with one or other of the eligible ladies but as years passed and dr lana remained unmarried it came to be generally understood that for some reason he must remain a bachelor some even went so far as to assert that he was already married and that it was in order to escape the consequence of an early misalliance that he had buried himself at bishop's crossing and then just as the matchmakers had finally given him up in despair his engagement was suddenly announced to miss frances morton of lee hall miss morton was a young lady who was well known upon the countryside her father james haldane morton having been the squire of bishop's crossing both her parents were however dead and she lived with her only brother arthur morton who had inherited the family estate in person miss morton was tall and stately and she was famous for her quick impetuous nature and for her strength of character she met dr lana at a garden party and a friendship which quickly ripened into love sprang up between them nothing could exceed their devotion to each other there was some discrepancy in age he being thirty-seven and she twenty-four but save in that one respect there was no possible objection to be found with the match the engagement was in february and it was arranged that the marriage should take place in august upon the third of june dr lana received a letter from abroad in a small village the postmaster is also in a position to be the gossip master and mr bankley of bishop's crossing had many of the secrets of his neighbors in his possession of this particular letter he remarked only that it was in a curious envelope that it was in a man's handwriting that the postscript was buenos aires and that the stamp of the argentine republic 
It was the first letter which he had ever known Dr. Lana to have from abroad, and this was the reason why his attention was particularly called to it before he handed it to the local postman. It was delivered by the evening delivery of that date. Next morning, that is upon the 4th of June, Dr. Lana called upon Miss Morton, and a long interview followed, from which he was observed to return in a state of great agitation. Miss Morton remained in her room all that day, and her maid found her several times in tears. In the course of a week it was an open secret to the whole village that the engagement was at an end, that Dr. Lana had behaved shamefully to the young lady, and that Arthur Morton, her brother, was talking of horsewhipping him. In what particular respect the doctor had behaved badly was unknown. Some surmised one thing and some another but it was observed, and taken as the obvious sign of a guilty conscience, that he would go for miles round rather than pass the windows of Lee Hall, and that he gave up attending morning service upon Sundays where he might have met the young lady. There was an advertisement also in the Lancet as to the sale of a practice which mentioned no names, but which was thought by some to refer to Bishop's Crossing, and to mean that Dr. Lana was thinking of abandoning the scene of his success. Such was the position of affairs when, upon the evening of Monday, June 21st, there came a fresh development which changed what had been a mere village scandal into a tragedy which arrested the attention of the whole nation. Some detail is necessary to cause the facts of that evening to present their full significance. The sole occupants of the doctor's house were his housekeeper, an elderly and most respectable woman named Martha Woods, and a young servant, Mary Pilling. The coachman and the surgery boy slept out. It was the custom of the doctor to sit at night in his study, which was next the surgery, in the wing of the house, which was farthest from the servants' quarters. The side of the house had a door of its own for the convenience of patients, so that it was possible for the doctor to admit and receive a visitor there without the knowledge of any one. As a matter of fact, when patients came late it was quite usual for him to let them in and out by the surgery entrance, for the maid and the housekeeper were in the habit of retiring early. On this particular night Martha Woods went into the doctor's study at half-past nine and found him writing at his desk. She bade him good night, sent the maid to bed, and then occupied herself until a quarter to eleven in household matters. It was striking eleven upon the hall clock when she went to her own room. She had been there about a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes when she heard a cry or call which appeared to come from within the house. She waited some time, but it was not repeated. Much alarmed, for the sound was loud and urgent, she put on a dressing gown and ran at the top of her speed to the doctor's study. "'Who's there?' cried a voice as she tapped at the door. "'I am here, sir, Mrs. Woods.' "'I beg that you will leave me in peace. Go back to your room this instant,' cried the voice, which was, to the best of her belief, that of her master." The tone was so harsh and so unlike her master's usual manner that she was surprised and hurt. "'I thought I heard you calling, sir,' she explained, but no answer was given to her. Mrs. Woods looked at the clock as she returned to her room, and it was then half-past eleven. At some period between eleven and twelve, she could not be positive as to the exact hour, a patient called upon the doctor and was unable to get any reply from him. This late visitor was Mrs. Matting, the wife of the village grocer, who was dangerously ill of typhoid fever. Dr. Lana had asked her to look in the last thing and let him know how her husband was progressing. She observed that the light was burning in the study, but having knocked several times at the surgery door without response, she concluded that the doctor had been called out, and so returned home. There is a short winding drive with a lamp at the end of it leading down from the house to the road. As Mrs. Madding emerged from the gate, a man was coming along the footpath. Thinking that it might be Dr. Lana returning from some professional visit, she waited for him, and was surprised to see that it was Mr. Arthur Morton, the young squire. In the light of the lamp she observed that his manner was excited, and that he carried in his hand a heavy hunting-crop. 
He was turning in at the gate when she addressed him. "'The doctor is not in, sir,' said she. "'How do you know that?' he asked harshly. "'I have been to the surgery door, sir.' "'I see a light,' said the young squire, looking up the drive. "'That is his study, is it not?' "'Yes, sir, but I am sure that he is out.' well he must come in again said young morton and passed through the gate while mrs madding went upon her homeward way at three o'clock that morning her husband suffered a sharp relapse and she was so alarmed by his symptoms that she determined to call the doctor without delay as she passed through the gate she was surprised to see some one lurking among the laurel bushes it was certainly a man and to the best of her belief mr arthur morton preoccupied with her own troubles she gave no particular attention to the incident but hurried on upon her errand when she reached the house she perceived to her surprise that the light was still burning in the study she therefore tapped at the surgery door there was no answer she repeated the knocking several times without effect it appeared to her to be unlikely that the doctor would either go to bed or go out leaving so brilliant a light behind him and it struck mrs madding that it was possible that he might have dropped asleep in his chair she tapped at the study window therefore but without result then finding that there was an opening between the curtain and the woodwork she looked through the small room was brilliantly lighted from a large lamp on the central table which was littered with the doctor's books and instruments no one was visible nor did she see anything unusual except that in the further shadow thrown by the table a dingy white glove was lying upon the carpet and then suddenly as her eyes became more accustomed to the light a boot emerged from the other end of the shadow and she realized with a thrill of horror that what she had mistaken to be a glove was the hand of a man who was prostrate upon the floor understanding that something terrible had occurred she rang at the front door roused mrs woods the housekeeper and the two women made their way into the study having first dispatched the maid-servant to the police station at the side of the table away from the window dr lana was discovered stretched upon his back and quite dead it was evident that he had been subjected to violence for one of his eyes was blackened and there were marks of bruises about his face and neck a slight thickening and swelling of his features appeared to suggest that the cause of his death had been strangulation he was dressed in his usual professional clothes but wore cloth slippers the soles of which were perfectly clean the carpet was marked all over especially on the side of the door with traces of dirty boots which were presumably left by the murderer it was evident that some one had entered by the surgery door had killed the doctor and had then made his escape unseen that the assailant was a man was certain from the size of the footprints and from the nature of the injuries but beyond that point the police found it very difficult to go there were no signs of robbery and the doctor's gold watch was safe in his pocket he kept a heavy cash box in the room and this was discovered to be locked but empty mrs woods had an impression that a large sum was usually kept there but the doctor had paid a heavy corn bill in cash only that very day and it was conjectured that it was to this and not to a robber that the emptiness of the box was due one thing in the room was missing but that one thing was suggestive the portrait of miss morton which had always stood upon the side table had been taken from its frame and carried off mrs woods had observed it there when she waited upon her employer that evening and now it was gone on the other hand there was picked up from the floor a green eye-patch which the housekeeper could not remember to have seen before such a patch might however be in the possession of a doctor and there was nothing to indicate that it was in any way connected with the crime suspicion could only turn in one direction and arthur morton the young squire was immediately arrested the evidence against him was circumstantial but damning he was devoted to his sister and it was known that since the rupture between her and dr lane he had been heard again and again to express himself in the most vindictive terms towards her former lover he had as stated been seen somewhere about eleven o'clock 
entering the doctor's drive with a hunting crop in his hand he had then according to the theory of the police broken in upon the doctor whose exclamation of fear or of anger had been loud enough to attract the attention of mrs woods when mrs woods descended dr lana had made up his mind to talk it over with his visitor and had therefore sent his housekeeper back to her room this conversation had lasted a long time had become more and more fiery and had ended by a personal struggle in which the doctor lost his life the fact revealed by a post-mortem that his heart was much diseased an ailment quite unsuspected during his life would make it possible that death might in his case ensue from injuries which would not be fatal to a healthy man arthur morton had then removed his sister's photograph and had made his way homeward stepping aside into the laurel bushes to avoid mrs matting at the gate this was the theory of the prosecution and the case which they presented was a formidable one on the other hand there was some strong points for the defence morton was high-spirited and impetuous like his sister but he was respected and liked by every one and his frank and honest nature seemed to be incapable of such a crime his own explanation was that he was anxious to have a conversation with dr lana about some urgent family matters from first to last he refused even to mention the name of his sister he did not attempt to deny that this conversation would probably have been of an unpleasant nature he had heard from a patient that the doctor was out and he therefore waited until about three in the morning for his return but as he had seen nothing of him up to that hour he had given it up and had returned home as to his death he knew no more about it than the constable who arrested him he had formerly been an intimate friend of the deceased man but circumstances which he would prefer not to mention had brought about a change in his sentiments there were several facts which supported his innocence it was certain that dr lana was alive and in his study at half-past eleven o'clock mrs woods was prepared to swear that it was at that hour that she had heard his voice the friends of the prisoner contended that it was probable that at that time dr lana was not alone the sound which had originally attracted the attention of the housekeeper and her master's unusual impatience that she should leave him in peace seemed to point to that if this were so then it appeared to be probable that he had met his end between the moment when the housekeeper heard his voice and the time when mrs matting made her first call and found it impossible to attract his attention but if this were the time of his death then it was certain that mr arthur morton could not be guilty as it was after this that she had met the young squire at the gate if this hypothesis were correct and some one was with dr lana before mrs matting met mr arthur morton then who was this some one and what motives had he for wishing evil to the doctor it was universally admitted that if the friends of the accused could throw light upon this they would have gone a long way towards establishing his innocence but in the meanwhile it was open to the public to say as they did say that there was no proof that any one had been there at all except the young squire while on the other hand there was ample proof that his motives in going were of a sinister kind when mrs matting called the doctor might have retired to his room or he might as she thought at the time have gone out and returned afterwards to find mr arthur morton waiting for him some of the supporters of the accused laid stress upon the fact that the photograph of his sister frances which had been removed from the doctor's room had not been found in her brother's possession this argument however did not count for much as he had ample time before his arrest to burn it or to destroy it as to the only positive evidence in the case the muddy footmarks upon the floor they were so blurred by the softness of the carpet that it was impossible to make any trustworthy deduction from them the most that could be said was that their appearance was not inconsistent with the theory that they were made by the accused and it was further shown that his boots were very muddy upon that night there had been a heavy shower in the afternoon and all boots were probably in the same condition 
such is a bald statement of the singular and romantic series of events which centred public attention upon this lancashire tragedy the unknown origin of the doctor his curious and distinguished personality the position of the man who was accused of the murder and the love affair which had preceded the crime all combined to make the affair one of those dramas which absorb the whole interest of a nation throughout the three kingdoms men discussed the case of the black doctor of bishop's crossing and many were the theories put forward to explain the facts but it may be safely said that among them all there was not one which prepared the minds of the public for the extraordinary sequel which caused so much excitement upon the first day of the trial and came to a climax upon the second the long files of the lancaster weekly with their report of the case lie before me as i write but i must content myself with a synopsis of the case up to the point when upon the evening of the first day the evidence of miss frances morton threw a singular light upon the case mr perlock carr the counsel for the prosecution had marshalled his facts with his usual skill and as the day wore on it became more and more evident how difficult was the task which mr humphrey who had been retained for the defence had before him several witnesses were put up to swear to the intemperate expressions which the young squire had been heard to utter about the doctor and the fiery manner in which he resented the alleged ill-treatment of his sister mrs madding repeated her evidence as to the visit which had been paid late at night by the prisoner to the deceased and it was shown by another witness that the prisoner was aware that the doctor was in the habit of sitting up alone in this isolated wing of the house and that he had chosen this very late hour to call because he knew that his victim would then be at his mercy a servant at the squire's house was compelled to admit that he had heard his master return about three that morning which corroborated mrs madding's statement that she had seen him among the laurel bushes near the gate upon the occasion of her second visit the muddy boots and an alleged similarity in the footprints were duly dwelt upon and it was felt when the case for the prosecution had been presented that however circumstantial it might be it was none the less so complete and so convincing that the fate of the prisoner was sealed unless something quite unexpected should be disclosed by the defence it was three o'clock when the prosecution closed at half-past four when the court rose a new and unlooked-for development had occurred i extract the incident or part of it from the journal which i have already mentioned omitting the preliminary observations of the counsel considerable sensation was caused in the crowded court when the first witness called for the defence proved to be miss frances morton the sister of the prisoner our readers will remember that the young lady had been engaged to dr lana and that it was his anger over the sudden termination of this engagement which was thought to have driven her brother to the perpetration of this crime miss morton had not however been directly implicated in the case in any way either at the inquest or at the police court proceedings and her appearance as to the leading witness for the defence came as a surprise upon the public miss frances morton who was a tall and handsome brunette gave her evidence in a low but clear voice though it was evident throughout that she was suffering from extreme emotion she alluded to her engagement to the doctor touched briefly upon its termination which was due she said to personal matters connected with his family and surprised the court by asserting that she had always considered her brother's resentment to be unreasonable and intemperate in answer to a direct question from her counsel she replied that she did not feel that she had any grievance whatever against dr lana and that in her opinion he had acted in a perfectly honourable manner her brother on an insufficient knowledge of the facts had taken another view and she was compelled to acknowledge that in spite of her entreaties he had uttered threats of personal violence against the doctor and had upon the evening of the tragedy announced his intention of having it out with him she had done her best to bring him to a more reasonable frame of mind but he was very headstrong where his emotions or prejudices were concerned 
up to this point the young lady's evidence had appeared to make against the prisoner rather than in his favour the questions of her counsel however soon put a very different light upon the matter and disclosed an unexpected line of defence mr humphrey do you believe your brother to be guilty of this crime the judge i cannot permit that question mr humphrey we are here to decide upon questions of fact not of belief mr humphrey do you know that your brother is not guilty of the death of dr lana miss morton yes mr humphrey how do you know it miss morton because dr lana is not dead there followed a prolonged sensation in court which interrupted the cross-examination of the witness mr humphrey and how do you know miss morton that dr lana is not dead miss morton because i have received a letter from him since the date of his supposed death mr humphrey have you this letter miss morton yes but i should prefer not to show it mr humphrey have you the envelope miss morton yes it is here mr humphrey what is the postmark miss morton liverpool mr humphrey and the date miss morton june the twenty-second mr humphrey that being the day after his alleged death are you prepared to swear to this handwriting miss morton miss morton certainly mr humphrey i am prepared to call six other witnesses my lord to testify that this letter is in the writing of dr lana the judge then you must call them to-morrow mr porlock carr counsel for the prosecution in the meantime my lord we claim possession of this document so that we may obtain expert evidence as to how far it is an imitation of the handwriting of the gentleman whom we still confidently assert to be deceased i need not point out that the theory so unexpectedly sprung upon us may prove to be a very obvious device adopted by the friends of the prisoner in order to divert this inquiry i would draw attention to the fact that the young lady must according to her own account have possessed this letter during the proceedings at the inquest and at the police court she desires us to believe that she permitted these to proceed although she held in her pocket evidence which would at any moment have brought them to an end mr humphrey can you explain this miss morton miss morton dr lana desired his secret to be preserved mr porlock carr then why have you made this public miss morton to save my brother a murmur of sympathy broke out in court which was instantly suppressed by the judge the judge admitting this line of defence it lies with you mr humphrey to throw light upon who this man is whose body has been recognised by so many friends and patients of dr lana as being that of the doctor himself a juryman has any one up to now expressed any doubt about the matter mr porlock carr not to my knowledge mr humphrey we hope to make the matter clear the judge then the court adjourns until to-morrow this new development of the case excited the utmost interest among the general public press comment was prevented by the fact that the trial was still undecided but the question was everywhere argued as to how far there could be truth in miss morton's declaration and how far it might be a daring ruse for the purpose of saving her brother the obvious dilemma in which the missing doctor stood was that if by any extraordinary chance he was not dead then he must be held responsible for the death of this unknown man who resembled him so exactly and who was found in his study this letter which miss morton refused to produce was possibly a confession of guilt and she might find herself in the terrible position of only being able to save her brother from the gallows by the sacrifice of her former lover the court next morning was crammed to overflowing and a murmur of excitement passed over it when mr humphrey was observed to enter in a state of emotion which even his trained nerves could not conceal and to confer with the opposing counsel a few hurried words words which left a look of amazement upon mr porlock carr's face passed between them and then the counsel for the defence addressing the judge announced that with the consent of the prosecution the young lady who had given evidence upon the sitting before would not be recalled the judge but you appear mr humphrey to have left matters in a very unsatisfactory state 
mr humphrey perhaps my lord my next witness may help to clear them up the judge then call your next witness mr humphrey i call dr aloysius lana the learned counsel has made many telling remarks in his day but he has certainly never produced such a sensation with so short a sentence the court was simply stunned with amazement as the very man whose fate had been the subject of so much contention appeared bodily before them in the witness-box those among the spectators who had known him at bishop's crossing saw him now gaunt and thin with deep lines of care upon his face but in spite of his melancholy bearing and despondent expression there were few who could say that they had ever seen a man of more distinguished presence bowing to the judge he asked if he might be allowed to make a statement and having been duly informed that whatever he said might be used against him he bowed once more and proceeded my wish said he is to hold nothing back but to tell with perfect frankness all that occurred upon the night of the twenty first of june had i known that the innocent had suffered and that so much trouble had been brought upon those whom i love best in the world i should have come forward long ago but there were reasons which prevented these things from coming to my ears it was my desire that an unhappy man should vanish from the world which had known him and i had not foreseen that others would be affected by my actions let me to the best of my ability repair the evil which i have done to any one who is acquainted with the history of the argentine republic the name of lana is well known my father who came of the best blood of old spain filled all the highest offices of the state and would have been president but for his death in the riots of san juan a brilliant career might have been opened to my twin brother ernest and myself had it not been for financial losses which made it necessary that we should earn our own living i apologize sir if these details appear to be irrelevant but they are a necessary introduction to that which is to follow i had as i have said a twin brother named ernest whose resemblance to me was so great that even when we were together people could see no difference between us down to the smallest detail we were exactly the same as we grew older this likeness became less marked because our expression was not the same but with our features in repose the points of difference were very slight it does not become me to say too much of one who is dead the more so as he is my only brother but i leave his character to those who knew him best i will only say for i have to say it that in my early manhood i conceived a horror of him and that i had good reason for the aversion which filled me my own reputation suffered from his actions for our close resemblance caused me to be credited with many of them eventually in a peculiarly disgraceful business he contrived to throw the whole odium upon me in such a way that i was forced to leave the argentine forever and to seek a career in europe the freedom from his hated presence more than compensated me for the loss of my native land i had enough money to defray my medical studies at glasgow and i finally settled in practice at bishop's crossing in the firm conviction that in that remote lancashire hamlet i should never hear of him again for years my hopes were fulfilled and then at last he discovered me some liverpool man who visited buenos aires put him upon my track he had lost all his money and he thought that he would come over and share mine knowing my horror of him he rightly thought that i would be willing to buy him off i received a letter from him saying that he was coming it was at a crisis in my own affairs and his arrival might conceivably bring trouble and even disgrace upon some whom i was especially bound to shield from anything of the kind i took steps to ensure that any evil which should come should fall on me only and that here he turned and looked at the prisoner was the cause of conduct upon my part which has been so harshly judged my only motive was to screen those who were dear to me from any possible connection with scandal or disgrace that scandal and disgrace would come with my brother was only to say that which had been would be again 
my brother arrived himself one night not very long after my receipt of the letter i was sitting in my study after the servants had gone to bed when i heard a footstep upon the gravel outside and an instant later i saw his face looking in at me through the window he was a clean-shaven man like myself and the resemblance between us was still so great that for an instant i thought it was my own reflection in the glass he had a dark patch over his eye but our features were absolutely the same then he smiled in a sardonic way which had been a trick of his from his boyhood and i knew that he was the same brother who had driven me from my native land and brought disgrace upon what had been an honourable name i went to the door and i admitted him that would be about ten o'clock that night when he came into the glare of the lamp i saw at once that he had fallen upon very evil days he had walked from liverpool and he was tired and ill i was quite shocked by the expression upon his face my medical knowledge told me that there was some serious internal malady he had been drinking also and his face was bruised as the result of a scuffle which he had had with some sailors it was to cover his injured eye that he wore this patch which he removed when he entered the room he was himself dressed in a pea-jacket and flannel shirt and his feet were bursting through his boots but his poverty had only made him more savagely vindictive towards me his hatred rose to the height of a mania i had been rolling in money in england according to his account while he had been starving in south america i cannot describe to you the threats which he uttered or the insults which he poured upon me my impression is that hardships and debauchery had unhinged his reason he paced about the room like a wild beast demanding drink demanding money and all in the foulest language i am a hot-tempered man but i thank god that i am able to say that i remained master of myself and that i never raised a hand against him my coolness only irritated him the more he raved he cursed he shook his fists in my face and then suddenly a horrible spasm passed over his features he clamped his hand to his side and with a loud cry he fell in a heap at my feet i raised him up and stretched him upon the sofa but no answer came to my exclamations and the hand which i held in mine was cold and clammy his diseased heart had broken down his own violence had killed him for a long time i sat as if i were in some dreadful dream staring at the body of my brother i was aroused by the knocking of mrs woods who had been disturbed by that dying cry i sent her away to bed shortly afterwards a patient tapped at the surgery door but as i took no notice he or she went off again slowly and gradually as i sat there a plan was forming itself in my head in the curious automatic way in which plans do form when i rose from my chair my future movements were finally decided upon without my having been conscious of any process of thought it was an instinct which irresistibly inclined me towards one course ever since that change in my affairs to which i have alluded bishop's crossing had become hateful to me my plans of life had been ruined and i had met with hasty judgments and unkind treatment where i had expected sympathy it is true that any danger of scandal from my brother had passed away with his life but still i was sore about the past and felt that things could never be as they had been it may be that i was unduly sensitive and that i had not made sufficient allowance for others but my feelings were as i describe any chance of getting away from bishop's crossing and of every one in it would be most welcome to me and here was such a chance as i could never have dared to hope for a chance which would enable me to make a clean break with the past there was this dead man lying upon the sofa so like me that save for some little thickness and coarseness of the features there was no difference at all no one had seen him come and no one would miss him we were both clean-shaven and his hair was about the same length as my own if i changed clothes with him then dr aloysius lana would be found lying dead in his study and there would be an end of an unfortunate fellow and of a blighted career there was plenty of ready money in the room and this i could carry away with me to help me to start once more in some other land 
in my brother's clothes i could walk by night unobserved as far as liverpool and in that great seaport i would soon find some means of leaving the country after my lost hopes the humblest existence where i was unknown was far preferable in my estimation to a practice however successful in bishop's crossing where at any moment i might come face to face with those whom i should wish if it were possible to forget i determined to effect the change and i did so i will not go into particulars for the recollection is as painful as the experience but in an hour my brother lay dressed down to the smallest detail in my clothes while i slunk out by the surgery door and taking the back path which led across some fields i started off to make the best of my way to liverpool where i arrived the same night my bag of money and a certain portrait were all i carried out of the house and i left behind me in my hurry the shade which my brother had been wearing over his eye everything else of his i took with me i give you my word sir that never for one instant did the idea occur to me that people might think that i had been murdered nor did i imagine that any one might be caused serious danger through this stratagem by which i endeavoured to gain a fresh start in the world on the contrary it was the thought of relieving others from the burden of my presence which was always uppermost in my mind a sailing vessel was leaving liverpool that very day for corunna and in this i took my passage thinking that the voyage would give me time to recover my balance and to consider the future but before i left my resolution softened i bethought me that there was one person in the world to whom i would not cause an hour of sadness she would mourn me in her heart however harsh and unsympathetic her relatives might be she understood and appreciated the motives upon which i had acted and if the rest of her family condemned me she at least would not forget and so i sent her a note under the seal of secrecy to save her from a baseless grief if under the pressure of events she broke that seal she has my entire sympathy and forgiveness it was only last night that i returned to england and during all this time i have heard nothing of the sensation which my supposed death had caused nor of the accusation that mr arthur morton had been concerned in it it was in a late evening paper that i read an account of the proceedings of yesterday and i have come this morning as fast as an express train could bring me to testify to the truth such was the remarkable statement of dr aloysius lana which brought the trial to a sudden termination a subsequent investigation corroborated it to the extent of finding out the vessel in which his brother ernest lana had come over from south america the ship's doctor was able to testify that he had complained of a weak heart during the voyage and that his symptoms were consistent with such a death as was described as to dr aloysius lana he returned to the village from which he had made so dramatic a disappearance and a complete reconciliation was effected between him and the young squire the latter having acknowledged that he had entirely misunderstood the other's motives in withdrawing from his engagement that another reconciliation followed may be judged from a notice extracted from a prominent column in the morning post a marriage was solemnized upon september nineteenth by the rev stephen johnson at the parish church of bishop's crossing between aloysius xavier lana son of don alfredo lana formerly foreign minister of the argentine republic and francis morton only daughter of the late james morton j p of lee hall bishop's crossing lancashire End of story six.